continue. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Christ loved us. And he gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Follow God's example as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Lord God, the Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you today, knowing that we have failed to speak lovingly, think purely, or act rightly. We have sinned against you and against others in wasting the precious time you give us, in our slowness and hesitancy to spread your gospel, in the faithful care of our relationships, in our restless and relentless preoccupation with worldly wealth, in caring for the bodies and minds you have given us, in our refusal to make you our first priority. Lord, hear our confession, for we have sinned and are in need of your mercy and forgiveness. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. And Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. So hear the word of Christ who is called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the peace of that forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. the giver of life, and the source of all love. We know that all we have received comes from your gracious hand. And you call us to be stewards of your bounty, the caretakers of all you have entrusted to us. Help us to always use your gifts wisely and teach us to share them generously. Send your Holy Spirit to work through us that many more might come to know the saving riches of your Son. And may our faithful stewardship bear witness to the love of your Son in our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Be seated. just experienced one of the most incredible, miraculous, 
generous things that a person can experience this side of heaven. We just laid our sins before God, and he promised and assured you that you are forgiven. You're at peace with God now and forever. Not based on what you do, but based on what he's already done. His promises stand. That frees us up a lot. That frees up our hearts and our minds to turn to God's word now and just say, Lord, how can I thank you? That's really the, the two examples we have in Scripture today of people who know and feel just like you do right now, forgiven and eager to say thank you to the Lord. Our first reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It was a, a collection of congregations, if you will, in, in a ancient Macedonia. Paul was writing to one of those churches and saying, take a look at your other brothers and sisters. Oh, look at the way that they are showing their thankfulness and love to God. It's not by looking inward to say, what can I do? But it's always looking upward and saying, how can I thank you? How can I thank you? And so may God work this in our hearts as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. And so we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And thanks to God, we are. These are his words. Alleluia. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Alleluia. As is our custom when we read the words and works of Jesus found in the four Gospels, please stand. Pastor Teal is going to lead us into a deeper dive of these words from Mark chapter 12 through our sermon today. So let's familiarize ourselves with the Gospel from Mark chapter 12. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put in the temple and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated as we praise our Savior with the words of our next hymn. <coughs>
Grace and mercy and peace to each one of you from God our Father, and it comes to you through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been going through this series on the grace of giving, and uh, if you've been here every week, or maybe if you're a, a first-time visitor today, you're probably thinking, oh, well, good, <laughs> glad we're talking about this today. What a day to come, right? But I really hope and pray that the series has been exactly that, about the grace of giving. It's really been about God's grace and what it does in our hearts. And, and uh, truth be told, we, we don't talk about this a lot in church, do we? But God does talk a lot about it in the scriptures, and so we turn to his word that speaks to every area of our life, even this, this grace of giving. So we've talked about the idea of um, first fruits giving, how we, we give to God first because he's first in our life. Last week we talked about the idea of proportionate giving as God has given us. So we give in proportion to what we have been given. And today we're talking about that idea of sacrificial giving. So let's dig into that as we look at the gospel today. Excuse me. You're sitting in my pew. Those are the very first words that were spoken to my wife the very first Sunday that we were at a church that we were going to. Evidently, everybody knew who sat where, whose pew was whose. Everybody except any visitor, except my wife. Apparently, she committed a grave church faux pas. Pew stealing. I think I've mentioned this one in a sermon before, but because it fits, I'll, I'll tell it again. I remember when I was little, the choir was singing during the offering. I wanted to see who was in the choir. I wanted to see them sing, so I turned around, but I didn't see the choir. I saw a scowl in one of these gestures. I was committing a major church faux pas. You do not turn around during the offering. Seems like there's a lot of church faux pas, aren't there? You know, you know what a faux pas is, right? It's, a, it's an embarrassing or tactless act or remark in a social situation. And it seems like, like basically, there, there's just little unwritten church rules, and you just need to know them. And you seem like you know them when you commit them, or when you commit the foul, or whatever it is. Can you think of any church faux pas that we kind of giggle at, but they're true? Thought of another one, maybe when you forget to silence your cell phone. Oh, man, that's a big one, right? Or uh, maybe uh, talking just a little too loud during the offering and everybody's looking at you. What about making change in the offering plate? <laughs> maybe a faux pas, huh? Well, speaking of offerings and faux pas, I learned one. Right after I was confirmed, and in our church, after you're confirmed, you, you get an offering envelope of your own, and I was so happy about that, but I, I learned very quickly, one of the things you don't do is you never look at the other person as they're giving their offerings, right? You, you, you put your offering in the plate, and you don't look at the other person putting their offering in the plate. That's a no-no. You don't, under any circumstances, look at that person, right? W would you agree with that one? That, that's a pretty good one, because... We, we want to be humble about our offerings, and we don't want to intimidate. So I get that. I think we all agree with that. You don't look at other people giving their offerings. Makes sense, but oh boy. If you agree with that one, we're going to have a lot of fun this morning. Because let's look at the first verse again of the gospel reading, verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. What's Jesus doing here? He's committing a major faux pas in a big way because just look at those words. Jesus didn't just notice a couple people putting their offerings in. He didn't just be happen to be walking by and just make a teaching moment out of it. What did he do? He sat down with his popcorn. And he sat down in the front seat, right where people were giving their offerings. And why did he do that? It was for the purpose of watching people give their offerings. 
And, and actually, if we, if we were translating a little more literally, we would say he was studying the people for a long time as they gave their offerings. So what do you think about that? Obviously, Jesus didn't know our church faux pas, right? Obviously, back then, they didn't have the right to privacy and all that, right? What do you think of that? Honestly, when you look at this and you think about Jesus sitting down for the purpose of watching people give their offerings, doesn't it make you a little uncomfortable? It does me. Why was he doing that? Didn't he have better things to do? You would think so. Do you know when he did this? This was just two days after he entered Jerusalem on a donkey, Palm Sunday. This is just two days before he was betrayed and went to the cross to die. There's probably a lot of things going on in Jesus' mind. It was a busy week in Jerusalem, and this is what he chooses to do. Why is that? I think, first of all, we need to come to grips with something. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Lord. That same Lord about whom we confessed in the very beginning of our service, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So all that wealth that people were bringing, that was his, not theirs. And so he cared. He cares. He's interested in how people were using the wealth and the blessings that he gave them. He's interested in watching. So what did he see? Let's take a look at a couple things that he saw here. Next verses say, Many rich people threw in large amounts. I don't think this is a big... Shocking, surprising verse. First of all, it seems like a good thing, right? The ministry of, of God's word does take resources and it takes large amounts of resources. And if people have a lot of resources to give, that, that makes sense that they come from them, right? So many rich people threw in large amounts. No big surprise there. But again... I hate to always say, well, what if it's translated differently? But there's a little nuance to the words if you make, take it a little more literally. How would you look at this situation differently if you saw the translation like this? Many rich people kept repeatedly throwing in large amounts. Now you, you're not paying attention to the amounts, but how are they doing it? The, the impression is given in the words that they would come to the front and make a large commotion with dumping their coins one at a time, ching, 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 so everybody heard it, and they would look around. But not only that, but then they would go back in line and do it all over again and make sure everybody saw them again, and then go back in line and do it again. It'd be like today, in a few minutes when we do the offering, if somebody said, excuse me, Mr. Usher, could you... Pass the plates by me again a second time. I forgot to put in my other envelope and put it in. You see what Jesus was seeing? Jesus was not seeing and paying attention to their amounts. He was seeing their hearts. He was watching the reason they were giving. And what he discovered in some people is that the reason wasn't about the Lord at all. It was about themselves. Thankfully, that's not all Jesus saw. Jesus also saw a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Again, not real surprising. We see a widow, and we know that, especially at this time, uh, the widow would not have had a husband to provide for her, so she would be poor. And this was way before Social Security, retirement plans. So when you see widow, you would see the word poor with it. And then the amount of her offering showed that, right? Just a, just a few cents. So not anything real big and surprising until you get to the next verse. Jesus calls his disciples and he said, truly. So here's the truth. I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. I just want you to imagine yourself as one of the disciples sitting by Jesus. You're probably already really uncomfortable because you're watching people give their offerings. And you're already kind of on edge. And now he says this. 
I can imagine all the objections and the questions and the head scratching. Wait a minute, Jesus. How can you say this? I get it. It's cute. But how can you say pennies are worth more than thousands? It doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. Wouldn't we agree with that? Of course. Because what were the disciples looking at? What are we looking at? We're looking at the amounts. But remember, what was Jesus looking at? The hearts. And when you look at the hearts, it's pretty easy to see what Jesus is seeing. Jesus gives us a little insight into what he was seeing here. The last verse. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything. All she had to live on. So it was like this. Yes, the rich were giving thousands of dollars with many more thousands left over. They made this big show but had very little sacrifice to them. They would still go home to their big bank accounts and their warm homes and their full pantries and refrigerators and it was really no big deal to give that big amount and it showed in their attitude. But look at the widow. She gave pennies with how much left over? Zero. That's right. Zero. She had no show but a huge sacrifice. Tiny amount, but total sacrifice. Because just, just look at those last words. All she had to live on. She had nothing left. Except, I would argue that at that very moment, she had absolutely everything. Because she had her Lord. And she had his promises. And she had the gift of faith from the Holy Spirit to trust completely in those promises. This is really amazing. I would boil it down to this. This is the takeaway, and I'm going to repeat this a number of times the rest of the sermon. But this woman gave beyond her ability because she trusted her Lord's ability. Beyond her ability because she trusted her Lord's ability. I suppose another one of the church faux pas that we kind of all know is that, at least in our Lutheran church, we don't shout out things during the sermon. We don't ask questions. We don't interject the pastor. We'll, we'll talk to him afterward or we'll talk about it at our table afterward, but we don't in the sermon. But I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion you want to right now. But, Pastor, what if the, what are you, are you saying, Pastor, I get it, I know that, because all week I've been studying this, these scriptures and, and just wrestling with them myself. I know those questions. So, I think this will help. Instead of you asking the question, let me ask you a question. I want you to think about this. If you were sitting right there with Jesus, what would you have said to the widow as she brought her two coins? What would you have said to her? Would it be something like this? Oh, dear. That's a wonderful gesture, but you don't have to do that. God doesn't expect that. He, he knows your situation. Would it have been something like this? Oh, Sweetie, that, that, that's so generous, but how are you going to eat? God wants you to be a good steward. Take those home and, and buy yourself some food. And, and when you catch up, then maybe you can give an offering. Oh, sweetie, money doesn't grow on trees. I know the Lord promises to take care of you, but... Would it be something like that? I would bet at least two coins that many of us often would try to deter her from giving that offering. We try to talk her out of it, but think about this. In doing that, what would we do? We would talk her out of doing the very thing that Jesus 
commended her for. What we would say don't do, Jesus said, well done. Why is that? Can we admit, this is coming from my heart first, so I'm just going to say it out loud and you can consider it for yourself. Can we admit that too often we are so eager to make these pious, biblical-sounding excuses not to return thanks to God? Or excuses to deter others from giving thanks to God? And I think the reason is simple. Like I said before, we are so busy looking at the amounts while Jesus really just wants our hearts. And when it comes to the heart, and you're wondering, what does Jesus see in my heart? It really boils down to one simple but very profound question. It's a simple yes or no question. Do we trust God when he makes promises? Yes or no? No in between. Do we trust God? Do I give my offering as though I completely trust that promise? Do I give my offering as though I am staking my future solely on God's ability and his promises? Truth is, so often we don't give first fruits because God is not first in our lives. So often we shrink back from that idea we talked about last week of proportionate percentage giving because we fail to recognize that 100% of it is God's already. I'm just using it. And we get a little uncomfortable today talking about sacrificial giving because we're probably a little too comfortable with our own wealth and our own way of life. And we forget about Jesus' total sacrifice for us. And so for just a second, we just need to say, can we be humble? Can, can we be honest and can we just admit that so often that's what God sees in my heart? If we can admit that, that's some really, really good news for you. You see, that widow, remember how she gave beyond her ability? because she trusted her Lord's ability, this is all about the Lord. You have that same Lord who keeps his promises, who gives it all. He gives his everything. He gave his own son. Your God gave more than two coins. He gave a double treasure of his perfect life and his innocent death. And here's what I mean by that. Jesus knew about money and worldly wealth. There was a time when the devil came to him and said, all this worldly wealth, I can give it all to you. But Jesus said no. And he sent the devil packing. There was a time when all of the religious teachers and leaders, which Jesus could have been, they were selling things in the temple and, and doing so in such a way as to, I guess, fleece the flock, to, to rob people. It was blatant, open greed, and Jesus could have ignored it, or he could have been involved in it, but no, what did he do? He, get, he, he made a whip and he drove them out. The point is, Jesus never had a greedy thought in his, in his mind. And why that is so important is because now his mind and his heart is yours. By faith, he has given you his perfect record, and that's how God sees you, perfect. But that doesn't mean Jesus wasn't affected by greed. It was greed for 30 silver coins that sent him to the cross, right? But on that cross, Jesus shed his blood and he covered every one of your sins and mine. They're all forgiven. That's your God who sacrificed everything for you. And it's not just that. It's, it's even a bonus Jesus knows about widows and about the poor and about all of our needs. We know that because days after he looked at this widow giving her offering, he looked down from the cross at another widow, his own mother. And even though his hands were nailed to the cross, he opened those hands and, and 
supplied all of her needs. And to this day, Jesus opens his nail-scarred hands and gives us all good things. Everything we have. In him we have forgiveness. In him we have life. In him we have this motivation to, to love him and to live for him. We have everything in Jesus. So let's, let's, let's look at that again. She, this widow gave beyond her ability because she trusted her Lord's ability. What's the take home for you? Am I saying that you have to give all you have to live on? I can't say that because Jesus did not prescribe that, did he? Am I saying you don't have to give all you have to live on? I can't say that. Jesus didn't say that. What's Jesus saying? This is an account not about money and not about amounts. This is an account about a heart that trusts in God. And so this is all about the Lord. So this is the takeaway. Look at your Lord. Look at his sacrifice for you. Look at his promises. And I'll tell you what, the amounts will take care of themselves. So, as the closing here, let's just take a few, look at a few promises and pray that the Holy Spirit would give you the trust, uh, give you the faith to trust in those promises. Here's one from Matthew. This is Jesus. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, all the work that he does through his word, the good news of Jesus, seek that first, and all these things will be given to you as well. God will take care of you. That's a promise. You can trust it. Here's another one. Romans 8. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? It's a promise from your Lord. You can trust it. One more, 2 Corinthians 9. God is able, talking about God's ability, right? God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's a promise from your God. You can trust it. So maybe I found the reason why turning around in church is a faux pas. Maybe it's a good thing. Not because it's embarrassing or rude. Maybe it's just because when we turn around, then we take our eyes off the cross. You see, when our eyes are on the cross, we see Jesus' nail-scarred hands open with forgiveness and every good gift. And all of a sudden, without even realizing it, our hands are open with thanks and praise. May God bless you with all grace even this grace of giving. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all of our understanding will guard to keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we have the opportunity to give our thanks to God. Um, there are uh, a couple of opportunities to give. Certainly the plates will be going around, but also if you uh, would like to give electronically, there are some options there in your bulletin. You can text give to that number or go to uh, the website or, or, or scan the QR code. May God bless us in the grace of giving. <coughs> During the offering, I invite each of you to take the, the red pew binders and pass those on and sign those. We're happy to have you with us today.
invite you to stand this time in our worship service. We get to bring our prayers before God as thankful hearts as well. And this morning, on behalf of two of our, our uh, Christian family members and uh, families, I should say, uh, Joyce Foss is having surgery this Wednesday. <clears throat> Pray for God's blessings and recovery in that. And also a prayer of thanks on behalf of Bill and Becky Walter. Uh, God bless them with a healthy, uh, beautiful baby boy, Marcus Eli. So we lift up our prayers together. Lord of life, uh, we, every time it happens, we marvel at the wonderful way in which you bring children into the world. Accept our thanks for holding your protecting hand over this mother and childbirth and for bringing joy to both Bill and Becky, the parents, with the gift of their son, Marcus. Bless Marcus, Lord. Receive him into your family through the sacrament of holy baptism and protect him from every danger of body and soul. And continue to give his parents the love, wisdom, and means to care for this child you've entrusted to them. And we ask this always in the name of Jesus, who is the friend of little children. And merciful Savior, you promise to be with us at all circumstances and in all times in life. And may that assurance of your abiding presence and your loving care comfort and sustain Joyce Foss this coming Wednesday as she faces and undergoes surgery. Through your promises, remove all the anxiety and fear she may have in her heart and through the Holy Spirit, lead her to rest her confidence in you. Also bless the work of the surgeon and give success to this surgery as it pleases you and then be with her as she recovers, filling her with that same thankfulness that comes from knowing your love and all your blessings. Dear Jesus, again today, you have directed our eyes and our hearts to the truths of your word. First of all, that you are Lord, and that word means something. It means you are the master, the creator, and the ruler of everything. And, and Lord, we can't help but thank you for being so generous and giving to us from which that which you have. You give us everything that we have in life, even the very breath in our lungs, and we thank you, Lord, for such generosity. And, Lord, we, we confess that even though we know this, we don't always show this. Sometimes we fail to recognize your lordship and your generosity, and that shows in our failure to put you first, to forget just how generous you've been with us, not just with our physical life, but more importantly, giving us every good spiritual blessing. First and foremost, your total sacrifice, giving everything that you are so we could be your children. And as we redirect, as you redirect our eyes to that promise, that we know that today, from now, all the way into eternity, that we are set, we are at peace, we have everything we need, open up our hearts. Open up our thankfulness. Open up our generosity so that we can, can give as you have given to us. And give us the grace of giving, which comes from knowing your grace. And the joy of giving, which comes from the joy of, of, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we ask you, Lord, as you open up our hearts and our hands, you also open up our minds to know all these truths. Uh, and we pray them in Jesus' saving name, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. If God's grace couldn't be any more evident to you through his word and promises, we come to this beautiful high point in our worship service now. That God actually comes to you um, not as a representation, but he's really here now in the body and blood that he gives to us in this Holy Supper. Now, we don't just do this just in remembrance. We're doing it as we receive Jesus himself. He could not be closer and nearer to you with those promises than he does uh, comes to you now through this Holy Supper. And so we prepare our hearts. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and grace. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the past, he spoke to us through the prophets. But these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, who is the radiance of his glory. And now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me then he took the cup and gave thanks and he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let me see.
Stand. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. I want you to remain standing for our closing hymn of praise. Mm -hmm.